So good morning, welcome to the Social Housing Roundtable. Um, I completely lost count of how many we've done. I'll, I'll find out at some point. Um, to anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Matthew Baird. I found this, I guess, during the uh, during the pandemic um, with the idea of bringing people together to just discuss any key topics in the social housing world, really, during a time when people couldn't get together and they've grown and grown and now we run them every single week, which is brilliant. Uh, the whole thing is backed up by my recruitment business. I always forget to do this bit, but it's backed up by my recruitment business. That's the reason they stay free. So if you are looking to hire, I've been working in the social housing recruitment world for 11 years now and genuinely know actually what I'm talking about in the sector. So if you are looking for support, please, please do reach out. Um, but without further ado, I'm going to introduce today's guest who I actually met first and foremost through an ADHD conversation we were having. Um, I put something on LinkedIn, I think, around uh, wanting to do a neurodiversity roundtable, um, felt it was important. I was kind of going through my own journey of discovery with a few things. Um, and we decided that meeting for a drink and discussing it would be a great idea. <laughs> and a number of drinks over a number of sessions later, and here we are, basically. So uh, to anyone who, who hasn't met Janine, um, She's a phenomenal ASB consultant, but I'll pass over to her to kind of introduce herself and I guess run through the, the key topics for today's conversation. Thank you so much for coming with us today. No, thank you so much for having me. Um, I Matt's been really kind there, but actually he asked me, well, I offered in typical ADHD style, I offered to do this about six months ago. So impulsiveness is something that we have in volumes. So Matt had put a post out, I'd immediately responded and gone, yeah, come in, I'll do this. Then realized what I had agreed to do. And it's taken me six months to get to a position where I've actually given Matt a date and here we are today. So first and foremost, I'm really grateful for people actually showing up. Um, what I want to do with this session really is share a little bit about my journey um, which sounds very X factory, doesn't it? But I, you know, I promise I'm not going to be talking too much about journeys, but a little bit about how I've come to be here today. But more so, I want to one, I'm going to address the stigma that's attached to ADHD, particularly at the moment. And I want to talk around that. I want to talk around why there is a stigma. I want to talk around how damaging that can be. I also want to talk a little bit around the kind of signs um, that we can see in people who have ADHD because they are really wide ranging um, and they are different for everybody who has ADHD. Um, but also I think they're quite surprising. Um, and that's one of the things, one of the reasons why I really wanna kind of talk about this stuff, which is obviously quite personal to me, but it's around really raising awareness around some of the signs that are lesser known. Um, because I think very much we have a stereotype um, when we think about ADHD. Um, and then I'm also gonna share some practical things that have helped me um, and that might, help you if you're here because you might have ADHD or because you might be curious because perhaps you recognize some signs in yourself or actually because you're likely to work with people who have ADHD whether they know it in themselves yet or not um, and so what are those practical things that we can do for ourselves but also that we can do for other people so I've got some slides because that's the only way I can keep myself on track and not keep going off on a tangent. Um, so let me just pull those up. Um, hopefully, Matt, you're going to tell me that you can see those. Amazing. Um, Good. And I will start by explaining who I am. So my name is Janine Green and I am a consultant. So I work in antisocial behaviour and I work with local authorities, housing providers and police forces to help them to develop their antisocial behaviour services. Um, and I've been working in ASB for about 17 years. So I do a lot of work with the housing sector. And that's how kind of me and Matt ended up first coming across each other. Um, but of course, this is not about antisocial behaviour. Um, so that's all I'm going to kind of mention in terms of, of who I am and what, what, my, what my background is. Um, I want to start with a bit of a disclaimer because I am not a doctor. Um, I am learning. And that means that my language might not always be right. You're going to have to forgive me. Um, there are also... 
a huge range of symptoms and signs in relation to ADHD. I can only share with you what applies to me. Um, that doesn't mean that somebody who is experiencing symptoms that I'm not talking about means they don't have ADHD. This isn't the exhaustive list of things that you have to have a check against to mean that you have got ADHD. These are just some of the ways it plays out for me. Um, and these are the things that I relate to. So that's my kind of disclaimer. I am massively still learning. I have only been diagnosed for a matter of months. Um, so I'm still on a massive kind of learning curve myself. And indeed, I suspect that I might learn things from today's session myself. Um, so I wanted to start off, bang, let's start with the absolute obvious, which is the elephant in the room, which is that everybody's got ADHD. It's the cool thing to have at the moment. It's a celebrity uh, status. It's fashionable. You know, people are wanting to get a diagnosis. And what you will have undoubtedly seen is that ADHD has been massively in the media over the last few months and not necessarily always in a good way. So there have been lots of opinion pieces from journalists who don't have ADHD, who are very much focusing on the stereotypes of everybody who has ADHD is just naughty and disruptive. And it's really, really super unhelpful. I mean, I wrote this presentation last week and even in the last week, we've obviously had Prince Harry um, now being diagnosed with ADHD. And I was saying to, to Matt before we started, you know, how unhelpful is that in the sense that he has essentially paid uh, for a ticketed event to have a psychology session basically to be diagnosed live with ADHD and that kind of thing probably isn't helpful in terms of the perception and the image that the media are giving out at the moment. There are lots of subtle digs in the media, lots of not so subtle digs in the media um, about it being a fashion label. Um, as I said, just this really limited and reductive view of what ADHD is, that it is about being naughty and disruptive. I am absolutely not naughty and I am absolutely not disruptive. I was the most well-behaved child at school that you could ever imagine. Disruptive would not have ever been a word that my teachers would have described me as. I was the absolute opposite of that. And that is really why we've got this massive misconception and why when you look at assessments so if you go online and look at some of the assessment tools they have been directed at assessing young boys with ADHD and young boys with ADHD present incredibly differently to adult women and, and adult men with ADHD so all of these things aren't aren't helpful in any in any way at all so why are we seeing so many people um, suddenly uh, being diagnosed with ADHD? Well, the facts are that it's believed that one in 20 people have ADHD, okay? one, one in 20 people. And that's whether people know that they've got ADHD or whether they don't, but a really high number. Of course, what's happening is as more people are talking out about it because they feel more able to, or because they want to raise awareness, more people are sitting there and going, you know what? I didn't know that that was a symptom or a sign of ADHD. That's me. I want to find more out about this. And as part of finding more out, they're getting diagnosed. So the, the amount of people diagnosed is increasing. They've always, always had ADHD. It's just that it's now being known and, and diagnosed. Um, and also COVID, we believe has led to a massive increase in people being diagnosed or people finding out that they, they have ADHD because COVID exasperated lots of things that people with ADHD find difficult. So suddenly we were working at home without as much structure, without a kind of office space, without a manager holding us accountable as much as, as as, as we might have had before, without supervision sessions as regularly, perhaps. So all of those things, that kind of loss of structure, 
really kind of made things quite difficult for some people who had ADHD. So again, in times, ter terms of seeking out why am I finding this so challenging, that led to a diagnosis of ADHD. So this isn't, isn't we're suddenly, you know, in this kind of pandemic of ADHD, people with ADHD. We've always, we've always had people with ADHD. It's just circumstances are now meaning that people are seeking help and getting the diagnoses. So this is as medical as I get, because this is as deep as I know at the moment. Uh, what is ADHD? It is far more than being a naughty little boy. Um, it affects executive functioning. So what that means is it affects memory, it affects organisation, it affects motivation, uh, it affects things like self-awareness, it affects ability to plan, it affects self-restraint. It doesn't have to affect all of these. You don't have to be affected in all of these ways. So I can sit here and look at that list and go, actually, I've got a really good memory. I mean, it's getting worse as I get older, but generally speaking, my memory is really good. Um, but I see some other things in me. So you don't have to have all of these things, but you might recognize some of these things. And it comes down to executive functioning. The other thing is that people with ADHD have lower levels of certain chemicals in their brain. And uh, one of those chemicals is dopamine. And you may have heard of dopamine because it is essentially the happy chemical. So it is the thing that gives us satisfaction, that gives us pleasure, etc. And I suppose one of the things that I was a light bulb moment for me when I got my diagnosis was suddenly... I understood why sometimes I didn't take joy from life. So I'd be doing something that was a really nice activity with my friends, but I wouldn't be getting excited about it in the same way that my friends would be leading up to that event, or I perhaps wouldn't be enjoying the moment as much. And so one of the kind of elements of relief for me was realizing, well, this is the reason why. Um, so I'm starting off from a deficit position, you know, and what, a lot of people with ADHD do to compensate for that is they act impulsively or uh, so for example I am the world's best shopper you may have just heard a delivery man banging heavily on my window just then that is guaranteed that he's bringing me some clothes or a new lipstick or a new uh, hair shampoo or something because I spend money that I do that very well I'm a professional shopper <laughs> Um, but there are other things that people with ADHD might do. So, for example, uh, there's a higher percentage of people with ADHD who also have uh, an alcohol dependency, who use uh, drugs, who uh, comfort eat, anything to derive some pleasure. And that's where that impulsive behaviour comes about. It's trying to increase those pleasure chemicals um, that we are lacking. So... A little bit about me. Um, I mentioned that I'm an ASB consultant and I say that with a little bit of a wry smile because that means that my reference point for ADHD has always been that 12 year old naughty boy that I was getting an ASBO on. Um, that was my reference point. I'm ashamed to say it but and that I guess is one of the reasons why I want to raise awareness on some of these things because I imagine that's the reference point for a lot of people. Um, Last year was really difficult for me. My, I'm going to get emotional. I promised that I wouldn't. My dad passed away last year in really difficult circumstances. That led to me seeking help. Um, I am very fortunate that someone very close to me is a qualified counsellor. Not fortunate because I always feel that they're trying to help me, uh, but fortunate in the sense that what they said to me was, look, rather than just going for counselling, because you've had counselling before, um, I think you should go to a psychotherapist. And I was like, what, what, what? what? He, he clearly thinks I'm totally crazy. What is this about? And he kind of went, no, 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 it's just because they can diagnose and they can prescribe and you might need some sleeping tablets, you know, to get you on an even keel again, blah, blah, blah. So I was like, all right, okay. Got to the end of the session, told them a story as I had with, uh, you know, every counsellor I'd seen in the past. Got to the end of the session, she said, yeah, I think you need bereavement counselling. Well, that wasn't a surprise. 
Uh, the bit that was a surprise was when she said, and I also think you might have ADHD and I would suggest that you go for an assessment. And I was floored, like literally shocked. It was, I could probably have listed about a hundred things before ADHD um, that I would have believed would have been more likely because it just felt what I'd seen on TV and what I'd seen in the media and what I'd seen in my ASB role was so far removed from who I am and what I do. I then went off on a massive journey of discovery. I uh, when I had a massive period of like hyper productivity and just read books, articles, listened to podcasts, basically overwhelmed myself. But by the end, I was like, wow, this is me. So this is just like reading, like almost a summary of Janine Green. This is me. And I then went through a whole range of different emotions quite quickly. So there was the shock to start with. There was then a little bit of an identity crisis because it was like, I'm, I'm successful in what I do. I'm good at what I do. How could I possibly have ADHD? Because again, that stereotype in my mind, those two things just didn't marry up. I then felt a little bit of shame and like that I didn't want people to know and that's still in me now like with the recent um articles uh, and headlines there was a little bit of me that really wanted to pick the phone up to Matt and say I I'm not I'm not doing this I can't do it I you know this isn't what I want people to know about me you know I need to think I'm self-employed I've got to think about the way people perceive me um but then very quickly I also felt, hang on, this is the missing piece of the puzzle. I've clearly always had ADHD, so this doesn't change who I am. This just makes me better equipped to work with who I am and know myself better and manage the things that I find difficult better. And you know what, maximize the wonderful things that ADHD gives me. And yeah, there's actually a comment in the chat regarding that. Um, I've if you want to name drop, I won't for the sake of the recording, but it said I thought for years I was just a naughty child and have an addictive personality, which makes oh. me spend a lot. But speaking oh, to my GP right. about ADHD was like a light bulb moment as someone else has said, or you might decide to travel 3,000 miles to go see a band. Um, you know, there's been a lot of unhelpful, a lot of unhelpful spotlight by both the media and the community about mental health issues and that mental health appears to be a popular and fashionable tag. And I'm so glad that you didn't answer this because I think it's so important that we are discussing this as a genuine viable just because you've got ADHD doesn't mean in any way like they're all for self-employed and actually there's loads of people who are self-employed who've got ADHD but that's a whole nother point oh, um, I mean, come on to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's where I say it's a relief because for so long I'd beaten myself up and thought I was lazy or disorganized or just simply couldn't understand why there were things that I wasn't capable of doing. Why have I gone through about 30 bank cards because I keep losing them? You know, why it surely it's as simple as there is a place in my home that I always put the bank card so I know where it is, or I get myself a wallet so that everything's in one place. Unless you have ADHD, you do not understand how difficult it actually is to do those really, really simple things. So I, yeah, Barclays, bless their hearts, it got to the point where I was making up excuses as to why I needed a new bank card because I was too ashamed to say I'd just lost it. So I was saying things like, oh, you know that bank card you sent me last week? Well, I've signed it, but then when I put it in my pocket, I smudged the ink, so can you send me another one? Because I was just too embarrassed because at the time I didn't know why I was doing those things. I just thought I was inept and incapable. And so the relief comes from knowing there's a reason um, and not beating myself up about it anymore. And, and I just want to say here that if I had a magic wand and could change things and could magic my ADHD away, I wouldn't. Because actually, I believe that the positive things it gives me far outweigh the challenges it presents. It is difficult at times. I'm not going to pretend it isn't otherwise but I can honestly say the benefits it gives me I, I really wouldn't change things it's just now that I know more it's just been a gift basically um so I just wanted to share a few things about how it might present in the workplace um so uh I always laugh a little bit because 
I have always have my screen so that you can just see this pretty picture behind me because if I turned my screen around or accidentally hit the button to change the camera view I think you might be quite shocked at what you would see behind the screen because there are about a million and one different notebooks there are things strewn all over the place and it's a chaotic mess if I'm honest with you um Again, I feel I have to say, because of being self-employed, that I am very organised at work because I have to be, because I've learned I need to be. However, what I always joke is that I all, almost use up my ability, ability to be organised in work. So therefore, outside of work has just got no chance. Um, so, yeah. Disorganised desks are definitely something you might well see. Losing things easily, you know, I've already talked about my bank card, um, keys, you know, very often the door will knock and I'll have absolutely no idea where I've put my keys and I'll have to keep the delivery man waiting for a few minutes while I seek them out. Procrastination is a big one. Um, there are believed to be a couple of reasons why people with ADHD are kings and queens of procrastination. Um, firstly, it's believed because we tend not to like detailed work. So if we've got big pieces of detailed work, we tend to put off starting them. But also procrastination gives us a perverse shot of dopamine because what it does is it creates a urgency that when we get close to the deadline, we've then like panic and the adrenaline kicks in and that actually gives us that shot of dopamine that we need. So there are a couple of reasons why we are likely to procrastinate. Um, we are we also i'm generalizing so apologies because not everybody will be the same but certainly some people will experience difficulty in putting plans in place so uh lots of people with adhd are this lovely mix of contradictions so i am incredibly creative i am a really good problem solver i think of really great ideas i have notebooks full of them and only a handful of them ever come to life because what I, while I'm really good at the ideas, I'm not good at creating the plans to put them into place. Um, detailed work already mentioned that I um, always find if I'm writing a report, I find it takes me just as long or longer to do the final bits, concluding it, doing the proofreading, because I don't like those kind of detailed pieces of work. Um, Scatty. So jumping from idea to idea, um, ADHD, people with ADHD, generally speaking, are very good at that kind of um, magpie thing where there's a shiny thing over there, so we'll follow that. And oh, there's a shiny thing over there. Um, so maybe seen as scatty and jumping around. Um, difficulty starting and finishing things can often be something. Finding the nine to five quite difficult. So one of the, you will find quite a high percentage of self-employed people, uh, sorry, quite a high percentage of people with ADHD are self-employed because the parameters and the social rules of uh, employed work don't necessarily sit with, with us very well. So, you know, having to work from nine to five when we are people that go through periods of being really focused and then really unfocused doesn't often work. And one of the joys for me of, of, again, knowing more about myself is that I absolutely now can go, right, I don't very often at all do a meeting before half nine because I'm not very uh, focused and can't concentrate very well before half nine. I know when my hours in the day are prime for me to get big, big pieces of work done. So I will diarise my time accordingly to how well I know myself. If I sit down to do a big piece of work and it's just not feeling it, I don't force myself to carry on. I'll find something else to do and then come back to that big piece of work when I know that I'm feeling more able. A big thing, I, you know, I talked about the, the fact that people with ADHD all have different signs and symptoms and experiences, but almost exclusively, it's been found that people with ADHD um, suffer with something called rejection sensitivity. So what that means is we really struggle with anything that is negative or we perceive as negative. So it might not be negative at all. So like a classic example, you text a friend and they don't text back for several hours. The ADHD assumption is what have I done wrong? 
you know, why there's is also that a thing on those, and there's a couple of points in the chat about this, but which is that email from your boss, hey, you got five minutes for a chat. Oh. And immediately it's just it's warning yeah. signs. You're kind of That's immediately big, going, I it used to terrify me, and people going, Why it's okay, it's just thing I'm like, no, don't like this, what's wrong? Yeah. And uh, actually, there's a, a, another point in the chat there saying, uh, I have to agree it's a superpower. I've had employees with ADHD um, and I've used their diagnosis to the benefit of the company. They have a different viewpoint and they see what we see as mundane in a different way. I found they're usually really empathetic and can relate to those who are especially vulnerable. They make amazing support workers. As an employer, it's about utilising those talents they bring, especially the ideas. And for us, it's just said they're the absolute worst. Just tell me what you want to talk about. Don't leave me open-ended. Oh. Yeah, like when you say, can you let me know what it is? And they're like, oh, don't worry, we'll talk about it when we meet. And I'm like, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm going to spend Spiraling. every <laughs> second between now and that meeting catastrophizing and thinking the absolute worst. Like, you're going to sack me. Like, I've done a terrible job. Mm -hmm. And it's and, and, and how it plays out. And again, to sort of explain how this has been really positive for me, like, there were certain things that I found really difficult as a self-employed person. So like I found it really difficult to send feedback forms after training sessions, even though I have 17 years of experience of it being, you know, the vast majority being positive. So my logical brain goes, these are going to be good, but there is something in me that just can't send those forms out. I find it really difficult to chase quotes up and I could never work out, you know, if somebody's asked me for some training and I've sent a quote to them, I wait for them to come back to me. I don't chase them up. And before my diagnosis, I was just like, well, you're just a terrible businesswoman. And that's what I'd say to myself. You're a terrible businesswoman. Why can't you follow a quote up? It's the simplest thing. It's basic business. Why can't you do it? And now knowing why, means that I don't beat myself up and actually I just pay somebody else to follow those up for me so and that's that kind of working around the things that I now know I find difficult not beating myself up because I find them difficult um and putting things in place to help me overcome some of those things um and also the other thing is we uh people with ADHD often have really big emotions so I will find myself with the smallest thing goes wrong and I will respond like it's the end of the world or I will be watching Anton Deck's Saturday Night Takeaway and I will spend the whole episode crying because of how wonderful it is and how lovely, very empathetic, empathetic, very emotional, um, etc. So um, it sounds pretty bad, right? Like I'm not selling this very well, uh, but... Um, here are some of the things that are absolutely amazing about people with ADHD. And this is why when I talk about that magic wand and not changing anything, these are the reasons why. So I am, uh, I'm going to big myself up. I'm a great problem solver. I am really creative thinker. I think that's why I enjoyed ASB. And of course, I only know that now looking back, because if you are an ASB officer, then obviously the ability to problem solve, the ability to think creatively, uh, is is really good good strengths to have um you know i am i will very often very easily and quickly get to the root of the problem when other people have been batting it around for ages um and i know that i'm very good at that um i have periods of hyperproductivity where and matt and i have spoken about this before you know i can achieve in an hour what it might take other people four hours to achieve and it's not slapdash it's not rushed it's still high quality work it's just that when i'm in it when i'm in my flow and that's again i knew about these things before my diagnosis but now i have that diagnosis i can recognize it more and i can work with it so when i have that period of hyperproductivity productivity I can choose the task I'm going to do in that moment to get the most from it really high quality work uh, is very often a, an outcome for people with ADHD it's I, I think it's a mix of the high productivity I think it's the mix of being creative being a problem solver I also think there's an element where the rejection sensitivity becomes a bit of a positive in some some respects because we are people pleasers and we want to do a good job and we want people to think positively of us. So as much as I might procrastinate, you will always get work from me by the deadline that I set and it will always be high quality. Um, 
we are very often we want to achieve more we strive to be more uh high achievers um and as you said matt like some of the most successful people in in the world have got adhd so richard branson bill gates walt disney whether you think prince harry is one of the most successful people in the world is your judgment but uh you know lots of really well thought of really good business people uh have got ADHD and I always I put here like it's a bit like a tornado because I think sometimes what you can see with people with ADHD is the things that I mentioned on the slide before so that kind of chaoticness that kind of jumping around that's almost like the kind of tornado of, of chaos that's happening around and if we can dive into the calm in the middle and kind of try and cultivate and capture some of those amazing things like the comment that you mentioned Matt about the person who's worked with people with ADHD and has been able to actually pull out some of those positives then we've can we've, we've got people who can be a real 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 asset to our workforces the problem is is that if we only see them in the way that I mentioned on the slides before, they are likely to be put in the terrible box, like, you know, like they're likely to be seen as a weak link, when in reality, they're probably some real superstars of your team, it's just that we've got to work with them. And just in the last couple of minutes, I just want to um, share some of the things that we can do uh, that have worked for me, uh, just a few things, I'm sure there are many, many more, but for me, some of the things that have worked for, for me that, you know, if you've got ADHD, it might work for you, if you recognise some of the signs, it might work for you, or if you work with people where you recognise some of those signs, uh, some of these things might help. Please, please, please don't go up to anyone and say, I think you've got ADHD. I've just been to a webinar and I've seen five things that I recognise in you, I think you've got ADHD. It's, it's not the right way of going around things, uh, but indeed, uh, these things are practical things that would work whether somebody has got ADHD or whether they just happen to have some of those characteristics that that are uh, that I've mentioned. So setting goals is always a, a really good thing with people for people with ADHD. I mentioned we're not great at kind of putting plans into place, but we are people pleasers. So if I'm held accountable by somebody else, I will get that done. So I found that coaches, mentors have worked really well with me. So I've set goals with somebody and then I've always achieved those goals. I published a textbook two years ago that would never have happened without a coach and an editor setting deadlines for me and moving me towards that goal. Um, if you are working with somebody who's got um, ADHD and you've put those goals in place, please follow them up. Um, you know, the minute I get a sniff of the fact that it might be uh, hot air and that I'm not actually going to be held accountable um, then that action plan is probably going to fall to the wayside a little bit so please help me by following me up on those actions. Um, there is uh, something called an access to work grant um, which is available for people who have got ADHD and a, a range of other uh, conditions um, and it's designed to provide a little bit of extra funding for people and it can pay for things like ADHD mentors and coaches etc. Um, thinking carefully about how we communicate feedback so like what I'm not saying is that you shouldn't give feedback to somebody with ADHD like that. Of course, that's not right. But it's just thinking carefully about how we frame that feedback. Um, just appreciating the fact that the person might be sensitive to receiving that and thinking about how we can um, deliver that in, in an effective way. Um, recognize patterns in our own flexibility but also recognizing patterns in the people that we work with and giving them the freedom the flexibility if we can to allow them to work with their periods of productivity and their periods of uh, less productivity um how can we maximize their ideas and creativity so how can we give them the space for people to share those amazing ideas those amazing uh suggestions they might have uh, the solutions that they might have to some of our business problems how can we create spaces for people to create those ideas and then give them the support they need to help put those things into place and so one of the things that's worked really well for me is recognizing that those things that i find difficult 
that I don't force myself to do them anymore and beat myself up about them, but I delegate them to somebody else. Now, in a self-employed world, that means essentially paying somebody. So I've got a virtual assistant that um, does a lot for me. Uh, fortunately, my business has grown significantly. I've now got a business manager. So the things that I find challenging, they do for me, which is massively helpful. In a business environment where you've got a team, you know, is there pulling on the strengths of a team, maybe reassigning some of the responsibilities to others um, that that person finds particularly difficult. But most importantly, aside from all the practical things, so importantly, is that we create a culture where people believe it's safe to speak up if they feel able to and if they want to. You know, this is personal to everybody. Some people might not want to share their experiences. But, you know, create a culture where... You know, people aren't joking about the news articles that they've just read. They're not, you know, taking the mick out of Prince Harry or, you know, talking about an article they've seen or, you know, being dismissive about ADHD. That it's a culture that is open and supportive and that helps to dispel some of the stigmas because, as I said, the stigma and the perception we see in the media is so far away from reality is so far away from how someone with ADHD really presents and it's really damaging and what I really want us to start doing is to start embracing it a little bit more and really seeing it as that superpower that the person in the chat referred to that we start seeing as actually an asset to any team, a gift to a team um, and we start helping people to overcome the things that they do find challenging and really helping them to pull out and, and give them the space to do more of the things that people with ADHD are amazingly good at. So I'm going to stop there. I have a slide. I'm not sure if Matt's going to share the slides or he's nodding. So I, yes, because I've just listed some resources there that might be helpful because I recognize there's probably a range of people on the call. Uh, you might want to find out more for yourself. You might want to find out more because you uh, want to better support your workforce. There's loads of podcasts out there. The one I particularly recommend is the ADHD adults podcast. Um, there is lots of information on the web, but remember what I was saying about a lot of the time, particularly when it's talking about diagnosis and assessments, that was designed for 12 year old boys. So it does say questions like, do you find it difficult to sit still? Uh, you know, were you called naughty at school? So it's not really designed for adults or particularly adult women. There's a great book that was recently published by Leanne Maskell, which is really down to earth, really practical, ADHD A to Z and the ways that ADHD can present itself. If you want to find out more about the access to work grant I spoke about, you can Google that, it's on the government site. Uh, lots of information on NHS um, about things like right to choose. I don't, I, I'm going to end by saying that we are absolutely in the midst of a mental health crisis. I think we've known that for a while. Waiting lists for ADHD diagnosis and help are shocking. Um, if you want to go through the NHS, you are probably going to be waiting about three or four years from start to finish. That's a long time if you are somebody who recognises it in yourself, is seeing it as a relief and a good thing, and you know you want the answers and you want to know how to manage it better, to think that you've got to wait three or four years is just simply not good enough. Um, so look at Right to Choose, because that's a way that you can shortcut that process down a little bit. If you can, and you're fortunate enough to be able to pay privately, uh, Psychiatry UK are usually the ones that are recommended for uh, online private um, diagnosis. That's who I went through. You can tell by my story that my, my diagnosis has been a lot shorter than if through the NHS. However, I am now waiting meds and I have been waiting for six months and I'm still waiting and that's paying privately. Uh, and things like the access to work, there's like at least a 20 week wait for that kind of thing as well. So it is difficult at the moment, but there is lots of self-help things out there just to help you understand a little bit more and, and start thinking about some of the ways that uh, you, some of the things that you might be able to do now to help yourself uh, to manage things a little bit better. You know, a few so, things in the chat which are amazing. I mean, Joanna uh, mentioned earlier, um, 
Ah, okay, excuse me. Um, when they asked to see you on a Monday and it's Friday afternoon, well, there goes my whole weekend. I think something like that is very much resonated. Um, and they said that she worked with ASB for several months and it was amazing. Finding the issue and fixing it in a month makes you feel incredible. Um, someone else mentioned uh, realizing my empathic nature and rejection sensitivity going into work would impact me outside of work. It encouraged me to start practicing separating my interaction, uh, uh, my interactions at work from my overall self worth. And uh, someone said that I find that I've moved jobs in the past after about a year because it hasn't given me enough to channel my hyper focus and creativity. I moved into housing apprenticeship delivery and quality assurance, which has given me an excellent mix of housing and the creative side of education, which is brilliant. Um, and Claire has, has shared a couple of things on there uh, from the ADHD Preneurs podcast, which are available on both Spotify and YouTube, I looked at. Uh, Safai, I saw you raised your hand. Did you want to come in? Maybe, maybe not. Yes. Oh no, sorry. I um, I I think it was an accident actually. But I wanted <laughs> to just say that, like, I really enjoyed this because I I only really learned that I had ADHD last year, and I'm like going through getting a diagnosis now. But actually realizing that certain qualities about myself and actually my mum, my mum is fully diagnosed now, weren't down to like me being like the odd one out. It wasn't just you know like. Um, or being oversensitive it was actually there was a reason that I like behave like a certain way around people which is really interesting also hyper fixations like I didn't understand why I'd like be so into one thing for so long and then be like actually I'm bored so like I'd go through jobs really really quickly like someone else mentioned they'd stay for like a year but it was more because I'd be hyper fixated on it thinking I really really enjoyed it but actually I actually didn't enjoy it. I, it was kind of like a hyper fixation that I'd had on that particular role, or um, like the like the like the actual atmosphere or the environment. It wasn't really actually something I like loved or enjoyed. And as soon as that changes, and um, Janine, I know you're about this. As soon as that changes a bit, that's it. You're gone. You're like, yep, yeah, no, done. As soon as that culture changes significantly, you're like, no, I'm. Um, I don't want to be here anymore. Yeah, exactly. I just I mean just to say firstly I mean like thank you for sharing that because one mm. of the I have uh that has been really reassuring for me is is similar to what you said like realizing I'm not alone and I'm not odd and I'm not unusual um and so I think while everybody everybody's got their own story and it's totally up to you how much you share uh, or if you share anything at all actually if people feel able to share them there's such a massive comfort in realizing that you're not alone um and and one of the things on the last slide i have put my email address because i'm always happy to talk to anybody um it would obviously always be completely between us but equally if somebody wants to share their experience or whatever it's really yeah. helpful for me as well because yeah. like I'm a 40 year old woman who's been diagnosed with ADHD for four months so like yeah it's, it's very yeah. similar to very similar to my mum like she was 44 I'm just, thinking, I'm just being compared to someone's mum I am not happy <laughs> I'm sorry I'm so sorry I'm joking, I'm no joking. but it was a very it, there was a lot of like a negative impact as well having that diagnosis initially um understanding that there's certain qualities of you that other people do find difficult as well um because they don't understand why you're like that um I'm really bad I just did it to you I think of what I'm going to say and then I'm like in there straight away I almost and it and obviously that's negative quality and I only just started to pick it up that it's like really bad and some people like don't understand why I'm like it but for my mum there was a lot of like negative consequences of getting that diagnosis initially and now because of all the resources available it's been really helpful like she's gone to uni and there's so much support now for ADHD where there wasn't previously but like the first time around with uni she didn't have that support but this time around there's people are getting more educated and more supportive of these things that's so really good yeah absolutely I laugh because uh being perceived as being rude or blunt can be something that happens quite often um, yeah, no. and because you don't think like I very often say something I'm like oh that didn't come up like out the way I meant it and it's that again it's that wonderful contradiction because we are people pleasers and we don't want to hurt like the last thing we want to do is hurt somebody so actually if something comes out the wrong way 
we feel worse about that than anybody else would do. And if we beat ourselves up for the next year, like waking up at two o'clock in the morning, thinking about something I said to you 12 months ago that you probably don't even remember anymore, but I'm still allowing myself to beat myself up about it. So There's a couple I mean, of points there in the I, chat as well. I want you to completely not beat yourself up about the fact that you said I was like your mum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm so sorry. There's a couple of points there in the chat, which are brilliant. And I've got Thomas and then I'm going to bring in... Uh, Councillor, I, I, I don't want to guess your name. I'm really sorry. I, I hate Sladdy. 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 That's okay. Sladdy. Uh, so Joanna said to the chat, um, uh, I made myself small for two decades because I was too excitable, too loud, too energetic, too impulsive. People called me rude because I didn't read social cues properly. I taught myself how to deal with it and burnt out and had meltdowns, which is where she's gone for her own assessment. Couldn't agree more. I was an awful manager because I'd go into hyperfixation I'd get everything done and I couldn't work out why people couldn't come along with me. Yeah. Also, I went to a board game convention when I started liking board games and spent about £400 on board games. So that was a whole other thing. Which my girlfriend came, I came home, my girlfriend was like, what have you done? I was like, board games! Because <laughs> um, that was the that was the thing at the time. Uh, Thomas, I'm going to bring you in and then I'm going to go across to Lade. Thank you for coming with us today. I don't know which Thomas we're speaking to. Is it me? Uh, yourself, yes. Yeah, sorry, I didn't realise... <laughs> There, is only one, there might yeah. be another Thomas who's <laughs> <laughs> anticipating. Yeah, I mean, this is the first kind of event I, I've uh, been to that's been ADHD focused since being diagnosed um, just a few months ago, age 35. Um, part of the reason I've decided to, to engage uh, and be open with my employer and friends and family is because um, the triggering part for me was an article that somebody wrote. Uh, um, I think, Janine, you said something similar where you looked at a piece of literature and really it was like looking in a mirror. Mm -hmm. um, it was very much the same for me. Um, uh, I was sort of gobsmacked and thought, wow, this is my wife. Um, having always felt a little bit different. Uh, <laughs> and then, uh, so I, I've decided that, that I probably need to do the same uh, with my own journey, um, as embarrassing and as awkward as sometimes that does feel early on, um, because you never know who you might help as well uh, and, and reach their own conclusions. Uh, you're quite right, it's not for me to go around diagnosing people, of course it's not, um, but, uh, but if I can be visible, then perhaps other people will recognise it in themselves and, and start getting help. As frustrating as getting the help is as well, you're quite right, the waiting lists are huge. Um, my own journey, I consider myself quite lucky um around 11 months from first suspicion to, to being diagnosed and then another few to, to begin medication which only began like a few weeks ago um jury's out on whether it works for me <laughs> but, um, uh, but yeah um just a thank you to everyone for, for, for sharing and um, this i'd say 95 percent of that overlaps with my own experience as well like you say there are there is some difference but um um I've been to another meeting this morning uh, that was incredibly productive from a business point of view, but emotionally, this one's been fantastic. Thank you. No, and, and again, thank you so much for sharing. Um, as I say, everybody has slightly different, slightly slight differences. And I think that's sometimes the challenge because there's such a wide range in kind of the ways that ADHD can play out. Um, but just thank you for speaking up because, I mean, I probably like you, I thought long and hard about whether it was the right thing to do, um, particularly as say being self-employed, so much is down to perception and reputation. Sure. And I was like, my gosh, like if my clients hear that I'm a bit chaotic sometimes and like I procrastinate, like, is that going to put people off? And then I was like, and I said this to Matt before we started this session, actually, if somebody is reading my blog I wrote or watching this and thinking, oh, I was going to work with Janine, but I don't want to work with her now, then I probably don't want to work with them anyway, because you know what I'm a great people person I am a, I produce really good quality work I'm confident in what I can do and if someone else doesn't want to work with me just because I think a little bit differently you know what that's their loss so for me far more important is to raise awareness of some of this stuff and I'm so grateful for other people chipping in because I was a bit worried that because of the subject I would be talking alone and it's really reassuring for me so thank you Thomas no, absolutely. I, th I think you're right that um, I'm, I'm sort of on a, an unmasking journey myself, starting to become authentically myself. Um, I, I feel like I'm yet to come into my superpowers, as it were, uh, although I have felt there have been previous roles where I've definitely felt like I've, I've had that flow state that you talked about. Um, that's OK. Um, and having the right people around you as well, I'm really, really glad to have uh, Sarah, who, who uh, works with me. Um, I'm not, it's not my business, I'm, I'm a business development role, but I have a fantastic planner um, and just general organisational person <laughs> who uh, I'm, I'm incredibly grateful to have. Sorry, I'm losing my earphone. <laughs> <laughs> no, no worries, so I'm gonna, thank you, thank you, Todd. I'm going to bring in uh, no Lardy. Thank you so much for coming with us. But that's 
it, it's brilliant. Actually, I just had a, a message there from, from Alison Sapp saying, have to say, listening to you all, it made me want to work with you all so much more. It's the human element that attracts us to those who can bring those skills into the teams that we lack. Um, and I couldn't agree more. It's, I would absolutely back myself against anybody because if you give me a deadline, I'm going to get three times as much work done. If you don't give me a deadline, there's a question mark. <laughs> but if you give me a deadline, <laughs> then I'm going to get a lot more done that time. Lade, thank you so much for coming with us, please. Oh, thank you so much, Janine. Janine, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Listening to you, listening to, I'm uh, reading all the things you listed on your, on your presentation. It was just like seeing myself in the mirror. And just like um, Thamo said, it's this is very productive for me, very warm. Uh, Matt's been doing this roundtable for a while now, and I haven't joined in a long while. But today, I just, you know, when I saw the topic, I'm like, oh, wow, I'd like to... I like to come in and just listen to my tribe. And when I say my tribe, I mean um, being able to um, somewhere, so, um, more or less like a safe space, yeah. more or less like being able to get some, hear people who feel the same way, people who have the same superpower like you have, people who have their brain in an, an almost permanently on an overdrive, and people who are chaotic. Yes, very, very good at what they do. Um, people who um, have their lows and have their highs, and sometimes their highs can be extremely, extremely, extremely high. Um, this is not exactly a question, but this is something that I'm personally doing in my workplace at the moment. So I'm the chair of the Enable Network. I have other forms of disability. People would term this as a disability, but I don't see it as a disability because it's actually an ability that you need to tap into. And one of the key things that I'm trying to do in the workplace is raising awareness about unseen disability. Because yeah. oftentimes when we talk about reasonable adjustment in the workplace, we're thinking of the loop hearing, we're thinking of making sure there's ramp, we're thinking of making sure all the other things are there. But what happens with ADHD, people who have neurodiversity and all of the other very many unseen disability. And one of the key things that I'm doing now, I, I work in a local authority, I'm a service manager in a homeless team, is raising that awareness. Mm -hmm. Not just with the authority, but everywhere I go to. When I stand up and I say to them, well, do you know I'm disabled? And they're like, oh, really? Yes, I am. And I'm not shy about it. Mm -hmm. And so this kind of event for me, when I saw it, it was like, I need to come. I actually shifted one of my meetings to attend. I need to hear. I need to see the kind of awareness we need to raise about our various forms because there's a lot of people who are out there who are suffering, who are still very scared of unmasking themselves. One, mainly because they're scared of stigma. Would the organization understand my needs? Would I be of the past? Would I be passed for the next promotion? Would they think I'm not competent? And all the many questions, all of us, just like you've asked Janine, um, Janine all the other questions we have, would they think I'm competent? Would they think they still want to do business with me? But you know what? I love your boldness. If they think you're not competent, that means you're, they, 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 they're, not, they're not, it's their loss. Absolutely. And that's the truth. It's their absolute loss. So thank you so much for doing this. The more the voices around this issue, the stronger we are and the better people understand that I have my low moments. I'm a morning person, for example. I'm not exactly an evening person. I can wake up at 4 a.m. and start. So I've had to do an under whatever on my signature. So I've had to put a note there. Please do not feel compelled to respond to my emails. I, re I write my, I respond to my emails at any time. Sometimes at 2 a.m. I'm up. And I'm doing things. So thank you so much, Janina. Thank you, Matt, for putting this together. This is brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so grateful for you sharing. It sounds like you're doing some amazing work kind of advocating. So thank you. Uh, absolutely. And it's, the roundtable's become what it's become due to the community that's built around it. And that, that term you used for safe space was absolutely great. You know, I mean, that's that's the whole point in this. It never, it, it doesn't, I got questioned recently by somebody who wanted to come on and run around the table and said, oh, well, I only really want to speak to chief execs. I was like, well, then it's probably not the platform for you because I don't mind whether you're somebody who is brand new to housing, whether you've got some slight affiliation with the sector, whether you're a chief exec or whether you're somebody who's just started in customer service or as a support worker. Your, your views are valid and your insight into the sector is valid. And when we're having conversations like this, 
you know, I know we've got a couple of minutes left, you know, the, those points, and Janine and I were talking about this before we started today. There have been a couple of points in the comments that many people are undiagnosed, struggle to understand, and struggle to be understood. And for our tenants, it's the same, you know, for the residents, for the people we're supporting. And sometimes it's about taking that step back and realizing actually we're, we might be supporting vulnerable people, as you've said, Lade, with diagnoses that we understand or with vulnerabilities that we understand or even who, who don't appear to have any vulnerabilities at all but there can be things there like missing rent like getting further addictions i know i've got an incredibly addictive personality when it comes to you know as soon as i fixate on something I'm like right i want all of that um as soon as there's a euro million it goes over 100 million i'll always buy a ticket because you're thinking why not and i don't i'm never winning that but it's 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 that kind of need and I think there's a huge piece there around supporting our tenants and and you know when Janine mentioned there about just keeping an eye out for the signs from staff and from tenants I think that's all it takes sometimes is going well actually let's accommodate but without calling out because I think that's the <laughs> if somebody had ever come up to me and gone oh well, you like that because you've got ADHD I think I'd have probably been offended when I was younger um and so taking it really really negatively as if there was something wrong with me uh whereas actually as an adult I'm like yeah it's it's great. <laughs> like you'd love the hyper focus, I promise you. Are there any final points you'd like to make, Janine? No, I'm laughing when you're saying about fixating because in front of me I've got uh, four lipsticks because I need <laughs> a back of lipsticks. Of course, I had to have four of them. So no, I was just laughing. Um, no, it's a really good point, and I um, I didn't want to because we were talking so much about kind of experiences in us as, as the workforce I didn't want to sort of move off topic too much but one of the slides in my presentation is around like what we might see in our tenants who might have ADHD so you know miss rent debts more susceptible to payday loans uh gambling uh you know you might it might be a house that you go into that looks a bit disorganized or equally there might be in uh, rent arrears but have lots of new gadgets and stuff so again just to start thinking about how it might present itself in the people that we work with well we said didn't we the universal credit payments going directly to someone with ADHD is just chaos incarnate yeah exactly so uh, so yeah really good point but no I mean other than really to say just thank you as I said there was a certain amount of apprehension I've the only thing that I've done sort of externally uh, before this was a blog post. Uh, I'm the chair of Women in Social Housing for the Midlands and I did a blog post for, through them. Uh, so this is the first thing that I've done kind of live. So there was absolutely a level of apprehension and, and fear and, and wanting to bottle out if I'm honest. Um, so just thank you everybody for creating a space where I felt comfortable in being quite open. Um, so as I say, I'm so new that to this, this world that uh, there's a huge amount that I'm getting from a value from this as well. Um, so thank you for giving me the the space, Matt. Oh, thank thank you. It's again, you know, I, I was quite happy to talk about it, but I wanted someone else to talk about it with me. I didn't want to do it on my own, so it was it was absolutely that. And and you've been brilliant, and and just really proud of the fact that you were able to kind of come forward there and gone. I know because I know we joked at the beginning about a little while for us to kind of get it together, but. To do it and to start this now is, is absolutely brilliant. And Bella's just put in the chat that I need to present appreciation for technology and development, which enable us to have these conversations, uh, understand people and their experiences better, improve diagnosis, recognize syndrome better, all of which helps to make workplace and society more inclusive. And I couldn't agree more. There's amazing people within businesses who sometimes you can look at, and I know we use the term chaotic or whatever others, but they aren't helpful, but who might work in different ways. And it's kind of going great. How do we get the most out of you? Because you're clearly brilliant. You're just not nine to five regimented, you know, and, and that's the way it goes. Thank you, everybody who could come today. Thank you for all the support and, and for everything, really. Um, I'm really, really glad we had to put this on today. And like you, I was kind of thinking, I wasn't sure how it was going to, how it was all going to play out. So thank you, everybody, for, for all the support. Um, and next week, Natalie Quilter is coming on. It's going to be EDI themed. I just haven't quite defined what area of EDI yet, but we'll, we'll, we'll get that all out tomorrow. And the recording of this will go up as I say, I'll put Janine's email around as well. So if anyone wants to get in touch with her, please do. She is also a phenomenal ASB consultant. So if anyone's looking for training or anything like that, please, please get in touch with her. She's Thanks, certainly brilliant at what she does. Thank you, everybody. And we will see you all at the next event. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. Take care.